Australia's Fraser Island is a paradise built entirely on sand. A paradise that includes every kind of wild environment. But it's also where dingoes and humans risk danger, developing a damaged relationship at the water's edge. Beaches break free from the coast to become roaming sand dunes, consuming everything in their path. Rainforest trees make their roots in sand, yet still rise to record-setting heights. And crustacean armies can materialize like an unending intertidal magic trick on the living beach. This is the wreckage of the SS Maheno, and the growing beach that is burying its rusting steel. Built as a luxury passenger ship and then used as a hospital vessel during the First World War, the Mahena was caught in a cyclone off the coast of Queensland, Australia in 1935. Finally, beaching here on a lonely stretch of Fraser Island's long eastern shore. In her day, the Maheno was 5,000 tons, 400 feet long and 50 feet wide, capable of carrying hundreds of passengers. Now, most of what remains of her hides buried beneath these sands. Ninety-nine years before the Maheno, it was an earlier shipwreck that gave Fraser Island its name. Eliza Fraser arrived at these same beaches in a lifeboat after her husband's ship was destroyed on the Great Barrier Reef. Fraser's survival story so captured the colonial imagination that this entire place now bears her name. But for the Aboriginal people here before her, the island will always be Guri, meaning paradise. It is a paradise built upon sand. This entire island is one single sand mass, the largest of its kind in the world. But being built on sand, doesn't limit its varied environments. The thing about Fraser Island is it contains a bit of everything. In such a small area, you've got a 100 kilometer island, quite a thin strip. You've got an amazing array of vegetation types. So you've got the coastal Wallum heathland, you've got open grasslands, you've got closed heathland, you've got open woodlands, right through to rainforest. That's the thing that sometimes you need to remind yourself that it's all sitting there on sand. Fraser Island is located directly off the east coast of Queensland, separated from the Australian continent by the Great Sandy Strait. This strait is a narrow sand passage estuary that at one point would have connected Fraser Island to Australia. Even when Fraser Island was part of the mainland, it was still a, a huge mountain range of sand uh, and then when the sea levels uh, rose up to their current level it became an island. The grains of sand making up Fraser Island arrive here on the tides and those sand grains are broken down bits of rock from Australia's mainland. The volume of sand here is more than any desert. Deserts are just a sheet of sand layered over foundational rock. While at Fraser Island, the sand runs incredibly deep. You have to dig down here uh, several meters in places hundreds of meters before you actually reach bedrock.
Fraser Island has been called the Great Barrier Reef of sand masses. Since 1992, it's been a UNESCO World Heritage Site, protected for its outstanding universal value. Sand is relatively nutrient poor, but this sand island supports an incredible number of plants and animals. The process allowing this to happen starts with every individual grain. On the eastern beach, you'll find the sand there is an orangey, brown, and yellow color. On the west coast, you find the sand there is white. White sand is very old sand, usually. Uh, it's a bit like hair. Uh, <laughs> the older it gets, the whiter it becomes, right? So the orange sand is exactly the same sand as the white sand. It just has a very fine mineral coating. Two or three percent of it are minerals. That's what allows all of Fraser Island to exist. If it didn't have that mineral coating, you would never have had the first plant being able to grow on the island because that's the first food for the first plant to start growing. Everything is interconnected, and I like the idea of that. Where the SS Maheno remains lodged in sand, and Eliza Fraser would have first arrived in her lifeboat, is the younger eastern shore. It's dominated by the coastal straightaway known as 75 Mile Beach. On this protected island, it's a compromise that this beach also functions as a highway for off-roading vehicles. One of the complexities of welcoming huge numbers of eco-tourists every year. Another complexity here is the relationship between tourists and the island's most famous species, the dingo. The dingo is an apex predator at the top of the local food chain. They are protected because they're in a national park. It's really important that we manage that population correctly. You've got one or 200 apex predators on the island. And even with a really low rate of problematic interactions between humans and dingoes, inevitably there's going to be some issues. For the most part, dingoes on Fraser Island have few interactions with human beings. They're quite shy and nervous around people. Exposed upon the beach, the dingo is a golden sandy color. With variable white markings on his chest, the tip of his tail, and the bottoms of his feet, which are often known as socks. The dingo is a rangy, fit animal, which can roam over a large land area daily, patrolling, hunting, and scavenging beaches for whatever might come to shore. Dingoes will eat basically anything. Vegetation, fish, small marsupials, insects, lizards, snakes, anything they can get. They're total omnivores, they're opportunistic, they're wily creatures, they'll just do anything they can to get a feed. The dingo isn't native to Australia, but arrived on these shores some 5,000 years ago in the company of East Asian seafarers. Though there's debate around their ancestry, generally, it's believed that dingoes descended from semi-domesticated dogs. Over time, these animals began to run wild on the island and return to their feral roots. But wild animals that still look like lovable family pets can lead to dangerous encounters. 
When fully grown, dingoes often settle into packs, as this makes for easier living and breeding. But when young males enter their juvenile phase at around 10 to 12 months, they strike out as lone predators in order to learn to hunt. During this phase, male dingoes will gain in testosterone and begin to test their environments. If they've already become accustomed to humans, because scavenging scraps around people is easy, deadly problems might follow. In that juvenile male phase, they're trying to you know, do dominance testing essentially. So they're basically, you know, coming up and saying, hey, here's me, you know, what, what, what's your stance on, on the whole situation? So a tourist who might not be well versed with the behavioural aspects of, of apex predators might misconstrue a bit of simple dominance testing as a real show of, of, of aggression that's going to end, end badly. There have been tragic encounters over the years. Several people have been bitten one person killed. Because of that death, more than 30 dingoes were killed in a cull. This led to more controversy, as government agencies and environmentalists clashed over the dingoes' future here. It's better for everyone, then, if human beings and dingoes observe one another from a healthy, respectful distance. As this dingo leaves the beach, retreating into the four dunes and beyond, things are as they should be. Our two species, separated by simple geography. Seventy-five Mile Beach is also home to the stuff of nightmares. What lies beneath these Australian sands is both completely everyday and squirmingly repulsive. This is the Digaster Keisti, otherwise known as Fraser Island's giant beach worm. They're huge. They get three to five feet long on average, but I've heard of even bigger ones than that. These worms are just unbelievably quick, and there are these professional worm catchers on the island because they're very good bait. And these bait worms are carnivores themselves. So what these professional wormers do, they drag dead fish or some sort of dead animal uh, um, along in the water, and the smell attracts these worms that live in the sand. And the worm comes along and puts his head up and he bites it, and uh, he arches his back. And when he's arching his back, all these little feelers down through the sand straighten up, and that's when they have to pick him up. The entire length of the worm can then be zippered out of the sand and placed into a bucket for sale. If this is paradise, as it's been dubbed, then it remains a wild paradise. For most of the length of 75 Mile Beach, there isn't a human swimmer to be found. This is because of strong warnings regarding dangerous tides and strong rip currents here. As well as poisonous jellyfish, manta rays, and sharks. Safer waters exist at the Champagne Pools, north on 75 Mile Beach. Champagne pools are a series of raised, rocky swimming holes over which the tide can crash and recede. Fizzing like so much sparkling wine. The rocks that make up Champagne pools, as well as the nearby bluff Indian Head, are some of the only rock forms studying this island made of sand. 
They are the only visible remainders of an ancient volcano long gone. In the shadow of Indian Head, a pattern in the sand marks the undulating progress of a sea snake. Cast onto land by the strong tides, it seeks to return to the Pacific. Usually when they're on the beach, they're exhausted. They, they move very slowly and uh, uh, they're, they're quite tired. They are, I think, more venomous than any land snake. They're highly venomous snakes. Called an elegant sea snake, this muscular creature is wrapped in 39 to 44 blackish bands. It has a very tiny head for pushing between cracks in coral reefs or rocks. This allows the snake to find hiding little fish to eat. Larger than the head is the paddle-like tail. It's shaped like a rudder, giving it powerful direction and propulsion in the water. Aiming toward the sunset, it makes its way back to the golden churn. Here, what seems to be an alien creature tumbling down the beach is only a rolling seed ball. It's a sign that a young beach is reaching a new stage of maturity. Because this is vegetative life, establishing its literal beachhead. The first plant to start growing on, on the bare sand is a plant that's called beach spinifex. You know, most beaches around the world would have something like it. Now, the way it reproduces has these little uh, spiky seed casings that roll along in the wind. They get blown along and then they get caught up and then they'll send down a shoot from there. Fraser Island's prevailing winds blow in a southeasterly direction first pushing onto land against the long, young strip of 75-mile beach. This wind folds sand on top of sand, creating subtle new geographic contours. When the hardy seed balls bump against those contours, they eventually catch, take root, and grow extracting what nutrients they need from the tiny amount of mineral content available in every grain of sand. The same mineral content that gives this young sand its yellowish tinge. This is probably one of the first plants to start growing on bare sand. Extremely tough. It acts as a colonizing plant, so it'll hold the dune system together and allows more and more complex plants to grow in a process called plant succession. That initial kickstart, that's what starts it all, really, uh, is the spinifex grass. Once enough spinifex takes root here, it creates a foredune at the back of the entire beach. This foredune is a protective barrier, sheltering everything further inland from the harshest of wind and salt. This allows more exotic plants to grow inland. As those inland plants flourish and then die over generations, eventually their decaying turns sand into topsoil. And that's how, how the island was formed, really. The sand, it comes from, comes from the ocean. Uh, it uh, builds up here as a big sand dune, then you get the plants and fungus growing together, helping each other out in a symbiotic relationship. And eventually, as soil builds up and the plants grow, 
if it was up to me, I would classify Fraser as a living thing, you know? Everything all work in, in conjunction as like a single organism. As the wind blows new generations of sand on top, the old sand mixed with organic matter gets compacted. As it gets compacted, it also becomes concentrated. The denser it gets, the darker it gets, and the more nutrient rich it becomes. Seen in cross section, this looks something like a layer cake, and the experts call these layers the A horizon and the B horizon. This is really interesting because in this road cutting, you can see how sand uh, forms on Fraser are how the, the nutrients form and get concentrated on. So this is the A horizon here, and it's in the B horizon where the, not only the colour is richer, but the nutrients are richer. In many locations on the island, sand becomes stacked onto sand. This can create striking multicolored cliffs, like those found at the Pinnacles, and Red Canyon, directly facing the Pacific Ocean. The colors in the B horizon here, yellow, orange, and red, are stains from rusting iron deposits. Iron accumulates in thin layers on the dunes over time. It rusts or it oxidizes and it gets washed down through the sand. It binds all the sand dunes, all the sand grains together and it holds them tight. It's very soft, you can break it up with your hand. Not only can it be broken up by hand, but it can also be broken up by claw. This nearby ghost crab digs into the base of a cliff excavating sand from its habitat. Male ghost crabs make tidy piles of sand next to the entrances to their homes, while female ghost crabs scatter sand in all directions. This particular burrow is made beneath an outcropping of coffee rock. Coffee rock isn't rock at all, but a form of hardened or indurated sand. Wherever you've got coffee rock, you'll know that at some stage in the past, it's been the bed of a lake or the bed of a swamp. Over eons, organic matter in those lakes or swamps would rot settling on the bottom as a putrid layer. And when the water evaporated, that organic matter fused with sand would still remain. Coffee rock is a, a living organism in itself in many ways because it builds up more and more organic materials. Now, this exposed coffee rock is almost a peaty, mummified version of itself. But it still looks good enough to eat. Porous, spongy, like a toffee candy bar. When water washes over a formation of coffee rock, it will turn the color of dark coffee or tea. But this hypnotic seep is not dissolving coffee rock. It's tannin-rich organic material, trickling away from one of Fraser Island's many creeks. Fraser Island also has many lakes. Lake Alum is a redwater lake. Because of the amount of plant tannins and organic materials washing their way into the water,
where there is this much vegetative life, animal life can also flourish. Lake Alum can reasonably be said to be teeming with small fish and turtles. Difficult to count as they swim and jostle with each other. There are two kinds of freshwater turtles here. The more numerous Kreft's river turtles with short necks and distinctive yellow streaks along the sides of their heads. And long neck turtles with snaking necks, almost 60% the length of their bodies. Their necks are so long that they can't retract them directly into their shells. But instead, fold their heads and necks under their shells with a sideways tucking motion. The Kreft's river turtle and the long neck turtle ably coexist, nipping at fish all year round in Lake Alum's red water. Another red water lake on the island is Lake Bumenjin. Though defined by the color of their water, Lake Alum and Lake Bumenjin are also both defined as perched lakes. Perched means that these lakes are elevated above sea level and that they resist being absorbed into the sand mass beneath them. You can dig a hole anywhere on Fraser Island. If you dig it deep enough, you'll always find fresh water. So there's massive amounts. There's something like four trillion litres of fresh water sitting inside the island. It acts like a giant sponge. But perch lakes don't absorb into the island's water table. Instead, they're like giant bird baths where the water stays cupped in place. This is because they're lined at the bottom with a kind of coffee rock, and this dense material keeps the lakes from draining. Lake Boomingen is the largest perch lake on Earth, almost 500 acres in size, and resting some 300 feet above sea level. Scrubby forest surrounds Lake Boomingen. It is a lively and deadly environment for many small species. This tiny plant dots the shoreline. Each flower is only an inch in diameter. Vibrantly colored, the Drosera spatulata is carnivorous, attracting insects with its nectar-tipped stalks. This ant, one of over 280 species of ant on the island, is looking to feed from the flower, but then becomes food itself. Glistening on these stalks is a sticky compound and a digestive enzyme. The ant wriggles in this trap, its body already breaking down into proteins for the plant to digest. Also nearby, this golden silk orb weaver, a couple of inches large, waits for her prey. This spider-striped yellow legs have evolved to aim inward, allowing her to specialize in the weaving of elaborate webs. It's said that the golden silk orb weaver makes such strong webs 
that the Aborigines would collect their strands and thread them together to make a resilient string. Having caught a fly, this female wastes no time in immobilizing the insect, then wrapping it in silk. She lowers the fly on a new thread, putting it aside for later, then waits for her next catch. There is comparatively little life at the beaches of Lake Mackenzie, which is a clear or white water lake. At this lake's bottom, there's microscopic aluminum within the grains of sand. This aluminum allows a special chemical process to take place. It's a process that sifts away organic materials, eliminating them like a natural water filter. With almost no minerals or nutrients left in this crystal clear water, it's beautiful to look at, but can barely sustain any life at all. And surrounding that water is a gorgeous beach made of fine white silica. This means the sand here is basically tiny granules of dull glass. It's ideal sand for sunbathing. But it's exhausted sand in its ability to support natural life. Like the water, there's little to no mineral value left in it. White sand and white water are both indications that Lake Mackenzie is an older area of the island. Roving sand blows on the island seem like they have a mind of their own. A sand blow is a moving sand dune pushed inland by prevailing southeasterly winds. Sand blows happen when plant life that usually acts as a barrier to keep the beach restrained is destroyed. These four dune plants can be harmed by fire, cyclones, too much tourist traffic, or any combination of these. Without a buffer now, the sand can leave the beach and travel as a moving dune inland. They move about meter, a meter, maybe two meters a year, and they just bury everything in their path. And they're, so they're essentially, they're like this giant wave. The largest ones, they get up to probably four kilometers long, many kilometers wide. These sand blows splay across the heathlands and forests, altering the landscape. Above this growing sand blow stands a solitary ghost crab. Ghost crabs change direction incredibly quickly and can approach speeds of 10 miles an hour. Having one enlarged front claw is evidence that this crab is a male. Speeding across the sand blow, his limbs leave behind a trail of tiny prints. There are currently 43 sand blows on Fraser Island. And one of the most famous is Hammerstone Sand Blow. which is slowly but unstoppably consuming Lake Wabi. 
So this sand blow here, the Hammerstone sand blow, probably originated about uh, 15 or 16 kilometres away. It's a very dynamic landscape because the, the wind is sweeping the sand from the surface of that sand blow, bringing it forward in waves, and then slowly they're starting to engulf the lake. Lake Wabi is an example of a barrage lake, meaning that it has been dammed in place by the sand blow. This causes the water surface area to shrink over time, but its depth to increase as the water displaces to narrower, taller heights against the bracket of the tree line, and the forward moving sand continues to bulldoze. Lake Wobby is one of the most iconic lakes on the island. So you've got this gorgeous lake that's created by the sand blow and is also going to be engulfed and consumed and destroyed by it as well. So, yeah, one of nature's little tricks, I suppose. But there are two sides to every story. And even though they're a destructive uh, sort of phenomenon initially, like they buried they bury the entire forest. Uh, every hill on Fraser Island at one stage looked like that, right? So they're actually a very creative process. You go back there to any of those sand dunes that you see on the island uh, in a thousand years, it'll all be plants again. Over time, the sand at the center of Fraser Island has compacted into deep, rich soil. supporting almost 20,000 acres of rainforest. The lace monitor, or goanna, spends most of its life in and around these rainforest trees, but comes down to the ground to forage for food. This big lizard is a relative of the Komodo dragon and can grow to lengths of almost seven feet. It has a powerful build and sharp curving claws, which it uses to climb. Its flickering tongue is deeply forked, like the tongue of a snake this tongue detects highly sensitive information about smell. And because it's forked, it can process that information in two different directions at the same time. This gives the monitor a heightened sense of whether a potential mate, predator, or prey might be nearby. This particular monitor is sluggish, like it's just eaten. Though its diet includes insects, it appears to be in no hurry to interrupt the highway of ants bustling behind it. Higher in the trees, the laughing kookaburra is one of the world's largest kingfishers native to Australia. Its name comes from the insistent cackle of its territorial call. Laughing kookaburras are patient carnivores, spending much of their time waiting for prey, like mice, lizards, and insects. They stake out on branches and swoop into action when they spot food. Whatever water this bird needs, it gets exclusively from the food it eats, even in a rainforest, it drinks no additional rainwater. <laughs> Laughing kookaburras make nests for themselves like this one 
out of tumorous mounds created by tree-dwelling termites. After feasting on these termites, the kookaburra will lay her eggs and rear her chicks inside this hollow. Generally, laughing kookaburras mate for life. This brush box evergreen is a host organism for the strangler fig tree, wrapping around it in a long lattice weave. In a dense rainforest setting, trees compete for water, nutrients, and sunlight. The strangler fig germinates at the top of the brush box in order to steal that sunlight, then sends its roots crisscrossing back toward the ground. Little by little, the strengthening fig tree will smother the life from the brush box. And these little tiny roots slowly expand. They're feeding off the detritus and the uh, dead material inside the bark. They keep growing and expanding, meshing, and finally they completely encapsulate the tree. It's one of the most wonderful examples of nature. Eventually, all that will remain of the brush box will be a hollow center. In its own way, though, the strangler fig is a bringer of life. Its sweet fruit is one of the key foods for animals in this rainforest. Meanwhile, this gigantic tree is found virtually nowhere else on Earth. But on Fraser Island, the satinae can live more than 1,000 years. Stretch to 130 feet in height and widen to a thickness of 10 feet. Before Fraser Island's heritage status took hold, these trees were abused by a busy logging industry and many of the largest satinays were felled. And it was certainly a lustrous uh, timber when it was sawn, but it's, I think it looks more beautiful in this forest. A great tree among many in a great green interior, all rooted in soil created from the beach beneath it. On the western side of Fraser Island, mangrove forests dominate two-thirds of the coastline. Mangroves straddle land and sea, their roots anchoring in mud while propping the main tree above water. For this reason, the roots are called stilt roots. Above water, stilt roots absorb air through pores in their bark. And below water, their cork-like constitution plays a part in filtering away salt. Mangroves can eliminate an amazing 90% of salt from their drinking water, making them uniquely suited to tough intertidal conditions. After this filtration happens in the root, it's believed that any excess remaining salt gets purged through the shedding of leaves. These leaves are called sacrificial leaves. Mangrove forests are key nurseries and feeding grounds for animals on Fraser Island's west coast. Where the west opens into wide beaches again, an amazing sight emerges. And emerges. And emerges some more. Full battalions of soldier crabs seem to materialize from nowhere, surfacing from their mucky burrows. Only fractions of an inch in size, this dark blue species forages, rustling up bits of microscopic food just washed ashore. And they make these tiny little balls of sand. They scrape the top of the sand into a little pile in front of them, and they put it in a liquid, a mixture of spit and water, it dissolves all the nutrients that might have settled on the top of the sand during the tide. So what they do, they'll, uh, they'll make it into a ball, dissolve it all, and then they just suck it all up. They suck up the liquid and it takes all the dissolved nutrients as well. Once a soldier crab consumes the nutrients in a particular ball, it discards the sand and forages for more. Here, the sand balls remain wet, like so much soggy porridge. 
This species scuttles forward on its legs, where many crabs move in a sideways fashion. They'll also corkscrew into the ground when disturbed, putting a literal twist on beach living. These crabs are air breathers and create oxygen pockets for themselves beneath the wet sand. During high tide, they'll wait in these individual burrows in order to avoid being eaten by fish. Then, when the sands expose again, soldier crabs resume their beach-wide march. The sands of Fraser Island march in their own way as well. Rolling off the sea, up the young eastern beach. Released into roving sand blows to wander the landscape. Accumulating nutrients from the plants they tilled in travel. Or from the rainwater they absorbed. Becoming a rich, dark soil to support the tallest of trees. Then, out the other side again, retired as a white silica stripped of minerals. So I think you always keep needing to, to take yourself back to that significance that it is. It's just, it's growing on barren, hostile sand and it's doing a pretty good job of it. Fraser Island is a miraculous ecosystem. This place called paradise. This sand mass. This island. This one living beach. Built out of countless shifting grains. <laughs>